Hello everybody, it's Saberwolf, and I am back with another D&D &D breakdown. This is the series that talks about the subclasses, races, and other things about D&D. &D. It helps break it down for you all to make it more understandable. Because D&D &D is a very dense and rule-heavy game, but which does scare some people away. But hopefully this series will introduce you to a new field where you can do improv, problem solving, and basically meet some new friends. Um, so I hope this is all helps you out. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go right into the series I'm currently doing, which is the Taldori Reborn. Uh, this uh, is a very dense tome, has a lot of subclasses. We're almost there. we got two more to go. And uh, also, if you notice below me, there's a new logo. This is my new Saber Wolf logo. It was picked out by uh, Varys. Uh, she picked out the shape of it, and then she colored it. with the, And we uh, kind of worked together to get the SW kind of built into the neck of it. Um, and she kind of said she colored it. I moved it over to Photoshop to help clean it up, and that's the finished product. So I hope you all like it. I really like it a lot, so looking forward to it. And also, again, I'll be heading down to uh, GamerCon, which is going to be the 19th and the 20th in March. Um, that's going to be down at uh, Mohegan Sun. So I hope to see you there. And uh, so I'll be doing my thing again like I did uh, previously. I, if you want to watch my... Um, content from last year when I went, doing a lot of interviews and stuff like that, so I'll be hanging down there again. But without further ado, we're going to go right into today's uh, subclass that is a sorcerer called the Rune Child. The mysterious weave and flow of magic is feared by many folk across Exandria. For some sorcerers, the body becomes a conduit for its power, which is collected and stored in the form of natural runes, in which sees a sorcerer named as a rune child. The talents of a rune child are rare, and sorcerers with this origin are sought after for study by mages and scholars alike, driven by a prevalent belief that the secrets of the runes can help understand the mysteries of magic. Others sometimes seek to enslave rune child sorcerers using their bodies as tortured spell batteries for diabolic pursuits. Rune child sorcerers are subjugated throughout the age of Arcanum, and many of their contemporaries now search for ways to hide their essence, a task that isn't easy given the nature of their gifts. So what does that all mean? Well, before, now usually I know sorcerers do have a uh, runic, uh, well this is going to be called a runic spell list. They have a different spell list, which they pull spells over from other domains or wizard or warlock areas and it, you'd be able to use them themselves but before i get to that we need to understand what the heck this subclass is so at first level we're going to jump to the first level stuff right now and this this is going to be the essence runes and this is what again this is what the subclass is about your body begins to express innate magic as runes trace out across your skin and you start with one essence rune and gain additional runes whenever you gain a level in this class. These runes can manifest anywhere on your body, though the first usually manifests on the forehead. Your essence runes remain invisible when inert. Okay, so you get these runes. I mean, if you look at the picture below me, this is the picture example from the book. Uh, this is Kazadron Sunscale, or Karzi for short. Uh, and you've seen uh, he's pointing to his arm, the uh, glowing little symbols. Those are the runes on the arm. That is pointing to now in the essence rune state when they are inert they are invisible so you will not be able to see these runes on a normal day-to-day -day basis however at the end of your turn during which you spend one or more sorcery points a number of your essence runes equal to the number of sorcery points you spent begin to glow with stored energy which is what you see on the arm now this is become this is what they're called becoming charged runes. So essence runes are inert, when it means they're invisible. Charged runes will be visible on wherever part of the body they pop up on. You use these charged runes to power your rune child subclass features. Also, as a bonus action, to note, uh, you may spend a sorcery point to convert two essence runes into two charge runes. Okay, so meta magic. When you use a sorcery point. You, you will meta magic can uh, shape spells to do other things, go further, have um, cast multiple spells at once, or copies of the same spell, and uh, like that. So when you, you you spend those sorcery points to do that, they get stored up in these runes on the arm. 
and they become and these essence runes now become charged runes and these charged runes now help the other features and other stuff you learn as the subclass levels as you go along and also as a point that you can use one sorcery point to gain two essence runes now you usually use the essence the sorcery point to do something else with the spell and you only gain uh, one, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So you use one sorcery point, you get one charge rune. Um, but you can use a sorcery point specifically to gain two essence runes, like you would if you uh, spend a sorcery point to gain spells, which is another way you can gain uh, these charged runes. Um, and also, by the way, if you have five or more charged runes, so five fifth level or higher, if you used a lot of spell slots without using the charge runes, um, you actually start emitting bright light in a five foot radius, dim light, an additional five feet. So if you don't have dark vision, you can actually, when you cast enough of these spells and have enough charge runes on your body that might be exposed, you do start glowing, um, within, and you can actually start seeing within 10 feet around you if you're in complete darkness. Um, and if you expend, if you have, if, if you expend a charge rune, it turns back into an essence rune, so it turns invisible again. In, in its inert state, and any charges, uh, any charge runes convert into essence runes after you finish long rest. So if you have a bunch of charged runes on your body that you never use, and you take a long rest, those disappear in your body. You just reset back to zero uh, charged runes active. So they all become essence runes. I hope I broke the hell down for you all to understand what this is. Now I will make a huge point. The only thing, the only problem I have with this actually, with this whole subclass, and we're going to have to go over to our handy dandy 5 to 5 e tools. Now, this is your, every single book that was ever created in D&D put online into basically a wiki format. It's called 5 e tools. I recommend it. I use it all the time for all the things I need to do. And if you know it on there, it says Sorcerer, under Sorceress Origin, uh, Font of Magic Level 2 is when you start getting these sorcery points. You sorcery points, you have two sorcery points at level two. So, which means that level one with these essence runes that are invisible, you won't know technically, and you can make this a story thing if you want. When you get to level two is when you actually are able to use these things. So, I don't want all sorcerers on we're subclass leveling is at levels 1, 6, uh, 14, 18. So in order to follow that guideline, this um, this specific um, for feat or feature for this subclass was put in level 1 to match with the other subclasses of Sorcerer. But technically, you, can actually, you cannot actually use this until level 2. And also, sorry, I want to go back to this again. Meta Magic doesn't even start till level three. So the only way you're actually going to be able to use these at level two is if you're converting um, both of these sorcery points to another level one spell slot. Then you would gain uh, two, actually, since you have to spend two sorcery points, you actually would get two essence runes. Uh, two, sorry, two charge runes, rather. So you technically can't really use this until levels two, maybe even level three. Unless you convert spells. So I'm just trying to make that point about this. Now maybe that's why there's some... Um, maybe that's why there's so much front weight into this thing. Because you have, a, again, a lot of stuff at level 6. Okay, I'm just putting it out there right now. With a subclass. So I'm just making a note that technically, although you get this stuff at level 1, there's actually a feature you actually get at level 1 that has to do with this. You technically can't use this until you get to level two, and only if you can use those uh, sorcery points to convert into a spell slot. So I just want to put that out there right now. However, uh, I do love this class already. This is my, probably my top two, I think, I have in this group. So let's push on, shall we? Now we're going to go back to the uh, rune uh, magic table, uh, runic magic. Uh, this is the extra spells that this uh, particular sorcerer gets. Uh, you need additional spells when you reach certain levels in this class, and it's shown in the runic table. Uh, each of these spells count as a sorcerer spell for you, but doesn't count against the number of sorcerer spells. You know, okay. So level one, you gain Longstrider. 
and protection from evil and good. That's a Leo favorite, so I know he would like this. At third levels, uh, you'll gain a lesser restoration and protection from poison. Hmm. At level fifth level, you get Glyph of Warding and Magic Circle. Hmm. Level seven, you get Death Ward and Freedom of Movement. And at level nine, you get Greater Restoration and Telekinesis. Now, the interesting thing about this particular sorcerer, and maybe they're making up for some things, I don't know. But in this particular subclass, when you gain a level in this class, you can replace one spell from this list from another of the same level. However, the new spell must be an abjuration or transmutation spell from the sorcerer, warlock, or wizard spell list. Okay. So, before we get into all the way into this, so let's figure out what kind of spells w could you transfer out. Now, I'm just going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about all sorcerer spells. I'm just going to focus on the warlock and wizard spells. Because the spells listed here are ones that are not on the sorcerer spell list. So these are extra spells that you gain, and they're considered sorcerer spells for you. What other spells could you swap out for these, like Protection of Poison or um, maybe Death Ward? What, what other spells could you swap out? Well, go back to our handy dandy 5e tools. So the list I have here, <laughs> that I have for you here, are the spells that are not on the Sorcerer table. They're on the Warlock and wiz uh, Wizard table. However, if you know if you note this part in red right here, this means that they are not on the do not appear on the sorcerer's table. Um, so we look at this list, we see um, armor of Agathis, is, that's interesting. Uh, arcane lock, snare, meh. Um, of course, magic circle of course, it has the ones you'd know on here, like protection, and evil, and long sorrow. Uh, non detection's interesting. That's an interesting one if you don't want to be detected from uh, divination magic, you're trying to hide. Uh, Going back to the whole thing about the rune child thing, having being sought after by um, by scribes and by other mages, you might want one to be detected. So that's a good spell to have if they're trying to search for you through divination magic. So that's a good one. Uh, remove curse. Uh, we have a fabricate Mordecai's private sanctum. Uh, pass wall is also an interesting one. Uh, you can have so there's are other options that you can have that were not on uh, this uh, particular table that are not listed as uh, spells you can get that that's core. Uh, so, but it's interesting how this subclass does allow you to gain other spells than the ones it would normally give you. I have not seen that on any other subclasses, at least when I go through things, I've, the stuff that I've gone through. So this is the first subclass I've seen where you can just say, well, I don't want that spell. I want this spell. It kind of follows along with the uh, trickster rogue where you can only get like illusionary magic kind of stuff. Um, and it kind of prevents you from going to like anything you want. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, so but those are some other spells. Now, of course, you can gain whatever sorcerer you want. That's also in there for abjuration transmutation. That's like spider climb and stuff like that. So those are also in there. Um, Alter self is another one. Um, the lower level stuff. Those are other spells you can have, obviously, that you can replace these with. And since uh, they don't count against the number of spells you know, this actually will allow you to gain other spells on the sorcerer table. So if you wanted multiple spells and you couldn't get it, you can use this little tidbit rule off of this one and replace something you don't want, like maybe a long strider, and you can grab something else. But again, that has to be at the same level per level. So you can't take long strider and get remove curse. It has to be a level one spell if you're going to swap it out. So there's a caveat there. All right. So moving on. Now there is another um, first level feature. And I'm putting I put in parentheses two level two because technically you can't use this till you get to level two. Um, maybe your DM can maybe fluff it a little bit. Um, maybe if you cast all your spells, maybe it'll charge it up for just before you get to this level two spot. Um, kind of make it a little storyish there. Um, but in essence, you cannot use this technically by by rules. You cannot use this feature until you get your um, 
until you get your uh, sorcery points, and you don't get your sorcery points until level two. So, just bear that in mind. Uh, but anyways, at level one, you get a Glyph of Aegis. Uh, you can release the stored power arcane power within your runes to absorb or deflect threatening attacks. Whenever you take damage as a reaction, you can expend any number of charged runes and roll a number of d6s equal to the number of charged runes spent. And it does no limit. You can spend any number of charged runes. So if you have five charged runes, you can roll 5d6 and try to eliminate all the 5d6 worth of damage you get. Again, yes, and the total roll reduces the incoming damage taken. Uh, at later levels, however, at level 6, uh, you can touch a creature as an action and expend up to three charged runes to transfer your practical power to it for up to one hour. When that creature takes damage with, during that one hour, uh, it can roll a d6 per charge given to reduce the damage taken. So if you use two charges, you touch your friend, and if they take damage within the hour, they can roll a 2d6 and reduce the damage they took by that 2d6 they rolled. Um, and at level 14, the die becomes a d8. So these all become d8. So you use 5, that's a 5d8. So you can get up to 40 points of reduction. Not bad at all. So going back to the other spells you couldn't normally get and swap out, like Armor of Gathis, that kind of makes it kind of pointless because now you have a feature that can do that anyways. Um, so they kind of overlap a little bit. So maybe you do want to take another sorcerer spell on that list to go over and do that. And what I mean, so if you think about it, what other uh, sorcerer spells would there be to choose from? Well, actually, if you go back to this whole spell list thing, yeah, the spell list got considerably longer. Uh, the, but again, it has to be abjuration trans transmutation. So you got, um, let's see, catapult, expeditious retreat, which is actually better than long strider. Um, in my opinion, uh, you get Alter Self, Mage Armor, Shield, um, Kinetic Jaunt for the uh, new stuff that's out there. So there is a lot of like new spells and other things that you can grab that would not be on the list that might be better than that Armor of Agathis that you might have not been able to usually get because your feature actually does kind of that thing. So by reducing damage and all, so or shield, or whatever. But again, level 2. <laughs> Not level 1, technically level 2. But level 6, again, you can um, again you can touch a creature by expending up to 3 charges to give it protection. Well, also at level 6, you also get Sigilic Augmentation. You can channel your runes to temporarily bolster your physical capabilities. When you make a Strength, Dexterity, or Constitution Ability check, as a reaction, you can expend a charge rune to gain advantage on the roll. So this is a kind of like an enhanced ability um, spell, but it only does strength, dexterity, and constitution. And you get to use this on a just your runes as a feature. You can just do it on a feature if you have a charge rune, which you can do by spending a... Um, by spending a sorcery point, you actually get two of these, and you actually can do this twice. Um, in addition, once per long rest, you can expend a charged rune as a reaction to gain advantage on a strength, dexterity, or constitution saving throw. Now, I noted that this way, uh, I wrote it, rewrote it this way because of the book, it was kind of didn't, it was worded convolutedly, so I kind of simplified it down. So, in addition, once per long rest. So, besides that you can do the ability check thing, this is a separate thing that you can do under this feature. Um, you can also get advantage on strength, dexterity, constitution, saving throws. Once time per long rest. This is separate from the ability check part. I just want to put that, I want to remind people. So, you can do as many ability checks as you want. The saving throw part, which is like dexterity against fireball, or constitution when you try to have a concentration on a spell if you don't have warcaster. That's the that so you can do that once per turn by spending this uh, by spending a charged rune. Okay, so I just want to make sure there's a lot of fine line stuff in this one. So that's really good. I will say you are spellcasters, sorcerers in general, wizards, whatever are not good in these three categories. Their, their numbers are usually low. So having gaining advantage on a check, 
by just maybe climbing or just moving or um, basically getting breaking a um, doing a, a grappling thing where you have to do a competitive check versus somebody else. Getting an advantage, getting to be able to roll the d20 twice is huge. So, yeah, this was really good. And I love enhance ability. Enhance ability, if it's available, I will always try to get it because it's not just for you, any of your team members who might be weak in that area who are going into, say, a story to in the library like we did the other day to try to read books. I can give um, Leo advantage, even though he has a high, um, a high investigation, I can make that advantage. So he has advantage plus eight, so it's almost guaranteed that he's, he's going to get this check done. Um, so this is really, really good. Oh, wait, was I, I'm not done with level six. We got more. Also at level six, you get manifest inscri inscriptions. You can reveal hidden glyphs and enchantments that surround you. As an action, you expend one charge rune to reveal hidden and invisible arcane traps, marks, runes, wards, sensors, and your glyphs within a 60 feet of you. So basically, <laughs> this is basically like detect magic. Except it's for hidden, invisible, arcane traps and marks and runes and wards and sensors and glyphs. I mean, this is like detect magic, basically, and you get it as a feature. <laughs> um, and you have to have a church rune again, so you have to convert from sorcery points over if you don't have any. So if you're just walking along, you can do it that way. Uh, these listed targets glow with dim light in a five foot radius for one minute. So they actually glow. So you can actually make things glow so the rest of the party can actually see these little glowing spots. So if you see an arcane trap and you can detect it with a 60 feet, the rest of your party will be able to see it for that, uh, well, for how long this lasts. <laughs> I think it's like a minute. Yeah, one minute. Um, you ha Also, you have advantage on intelligence arcana checks to discern the nature of any magic revealed in this way for the duration. So besides having advantage on strength, dexterity, and constitution... You also get advantage on intelligence arcana checks, too, <laughs> at level six. So you basically get advantage on four of the six attributes that you have. Yeah. And if the glyph you reveal means something in another language that you can't read, you can understand them while they are glowing as if you know that language. So you get comprehend languages with this thing, too. So you can detect traps... You can find runes, they glow so everybody can see it, you gain advantage on the checks, and you get comprehended languages so you actually know what it says. And all it costs you is one charge rune. <laughs> it lasts for a minute, so you may have to use multiples, in order to maybe, because if it's a longer set of glyphs, maybe you have to do it in multiples. What you gotta do is just pop a uh, sorcery point, and you can just do this. You don't even use a spell slot. Huh. <sighs> I like this class. I really sad. I love this subclass. It, it touches on all the areas I like to have on my character. That is, um, and it's so mysterious with the runes and everything. I, I, I just love this subclass already, guys. I really do. This is probably my, like I said, this is probably one of my favorites so far. Now, again, for sorcerers, you have a little bit of a gap because we have a lot of level sixes. That's really nice because that's going to have to carry us because now. We don't get anything to level 14, so more than double our level that we already got to before we actually get a new feature. But it's a good one. You channel your runic energy to overpower even the staunchest of defenses. When you cast a spell, you can expend two charged runes to cause this spell to deal force damage instead of its usual damage types. So force damage is a damage type that not many creatures are immune to. You have a lot of creatures immune to fire, ice, even psychic damage like you ran into last night with Leo when he rolled a double nat 20 and got denied the damage because the thing he hit was immune to psychic damage. <laughs> Force damage, very few. Like I think like maybe four or five creatures in D&D are actually immune to force damage or at least reduced damage to force damage. So ch changing a fireball into force damage... And you can, so basically, you can basically use sorcery points to twin spell, double fireballs, 
and then use uh, and use those spent charges to change one of them. I would say, or if you have an extra four more charge runes on you, you can actually do four charge runes. I think would have to take to cause the double fireball to you do force damage. Yeah, and that's not all. <laughs> If you haven't read ahead yet. Additionally, all creatures targeted by the spell or within the spell's area must succeed on a strength saving throw versus your spell DC to either be knocked to prone or push back 15 feet from the spell's origin point. Your choice of which one you want to do. So you can do double fireball force damage, make them have to roll twice on strength saving throws to get knocked down prone, and they would have to roll a dexterity saving check just to avoid the damage. So they're able, now they have to roll three saving throws, one dex, two strength, on a double fireball to prevent it from being knocked down or thrown back, say, even 30 feet away. <laughs> and, by the way, you can use this feature. You cannot use it again unless you complete a short or long rest. So you can have a short rest to be able to do this again if you wanted to. Which falls in the line with the sorcerer or warlock stuff. You need to do a lot of short resting. Uh, you get this feature back when you do it. So uh, <laughs> this is this this class is insane. <laughs> it really is. Um, and last but not least is our cap ability, and that is arcane exemplar. You can use a bonus action to expend a charged rune, one charged rune, uh, to become a being of pure magical energy. While in your exemplar form, you gain the following benefits. Okay. You have flying speed up to 60 feet. All right, we're already breaking the rules here. <laughs> uh, creatures have disadvantage on saving throws against your sorcerer spells. Double fireball at disadvantage now. Think about it. You have resistance to damage dealt by spells. So usually when you have a magical, um, anti-magic stuff, like gnomes, um, you have advantage on saving throws against the spells, but this actually reduces the damage even just dealt by spells. So whether you have to save for it, or if it's just a straight attack roll, if it's just a straight attack roll, you only take half damage like if you're a barbarian and you're raging. And whenever you cast a spell level 1 or higher, non-cantrip basically, uh, you regain hit points equal to the spell's level. Yeah, okay. Y you, you cast a level 4 spell, you get 4 hit points. At this point in the game, when you're level 18, 19, 20, 4 hit points isn't really that much. Sorcerer, maybe a little more so because your HP pulls not that high. Every little bit helps. It's just a little, it's a little, it's just a little cherry on top of this beautiful Sunday that we're building right now. Flying, disadvantage on saving throws, resistance to spells. Cherry on top is we gain a little HP every time you cast a spell. Your exemplar form lasts until the end of your turn, unless you spend additional charge rune to maintain it. No additional action required. So essentially, when you first start this up, you can spend two charge runes basically to. Uh, forego this ending at the end of your turn to have it continue to your end of your next turn and so on and so forth by spending these runes. And when your exemplar form ends, however, you are st stunned until the end of your next turn. Let's go back in time about the whole theme of this whole entire book. This whole entire book and all these subclasses is taking the good and giving yourself the bad with it. <laughs> so this is the good versus bad part of this particular thing. So you're gaining fly speed, disadvantage, saving throws, resistance to spell damage, but I am stunned myself at the end of the thing. Yeah. And it's until the end of your next turn. Let me specify again. So when your turn ends and this drops, you are now officially stunned. You are stunned until your turn comes back around a second time around. So when your turn ends, you start being stunned. You go all the way around back to the beginning again. 
And if you and if I look up the uh, what the stunned means, <laughs> if we go to our handy dandy uh, quick reference here, being stunned means you are incapacitated, you can't move, and you can, but you can speak only uh, falteringly. Attack rolls against you have advantage, and you automatically fail strength and dexterity saving throws. So, turn ends, you now become stunned, you go through all the way around to turn comes back up again, and you're stunned till the end of that turn. So basically you skip your turn on top of that. So it's a little rough. <laughs> you want to make sure you have charged runes. You want to make sure that you're using your meta magic and amplifying all the spells you're using so you can maintain this. Again, combat usually in D&D &D doesn't last past uh, six, seven turns, six to eight turns, I'll say doesn't really go past six to eight turns if it goes past six to eight turns it's either a end boss fight or you are fighting an ongoing fight struggle like we did with the giants in campaign one which i know nobody saw but except for us but but it was an ongoing combat where you're fighting an army um those are the rare cases um but usually in combat it only goes five to eight turns so if you have five, if you can gain six to eight charge runes, which you should have eighteen charge runes available uh, to you at this point, uh, when if you max it all out and you're glowing also at this point, um, you will be able to maintain it throughout the combat. Um, just make sure when the combat ends, you make sure you have another charge rune to be able to land on the ground before you end it. Because if you're stunned and you're in the air, you're also going to take that fall damage. <laughs> so. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> and since it's strength is... Uh, I don't know if it's a dexterity or strength saving throw of that, but you automatically fail, so you just can take the fall damage of the fall. <laughs> so just just make a point of that to make sure that you have available extra pool there to keep sure you maintain this and use that meta magic throughout the combat to amplify your spells and keep that whole loop going. Because, again, there's no additional... Because there is no additional action required to keep it up. So you don't have to spend a reaction. You don't have to spend a bonus action to keep this going. You could just, oh, I have an extra, oh, I have, I'm going to use this extra charger just to keep going. Um, and again, you can only use this once per long rest, obviously, because this is flying disadvantage to my spells. I'm gaining resistance to uh, other spells that are coming at me. It basically turned into a raging spell using barbarian. I mean, it's crazy. Um, what do I think about this subclass? Again, like I just said, it's crazy. <laughs> I love it. I love the uh, spell abilities. I know, I know going back to the fact that you can't use your first feature until you get to level two. And it's very succinct that you can only have to convert it into a spell slot. <laughs> Except for that one caveat thing. The story that you can build off of this rune child as a backstory and being pursued by these other powers at B or you can freak out your party member that I'm a magic user. You can Harry Potter this with the scar on the forehead thing. It has a lot of story stuff and you can do a lot of cool story ability stuff. Again, we have the uh, advantage to strength, dexterity, and constitution ability checks and intelligence arcana checks uh, that you can do. So you can do this, uh, this stuff that you can do outside of combat with this. Um, and you basically replace the rogue by detecting arcane traps. Now, it doesn't detect regular traps, arcane traps. Just make a note of that. Those are two different things. Um, but yeah, the rune child definitely up on the top of my list that I want, and I have not played sorcerer yet. Technically, I am playing a sorcerer now because it's a paladin and sorcerer. I have not played an actual full-on sorcerer yet. So, well, no, I take that back. I did because of my cleric in that one shot. I take that back. <laughs> but this sorcerer, I do definitely want to try. Um, but I'll do it again. This is from the Taldori Report book. This is from Matt Mercer and the uh, Critical Role people. I do have one more subclass to go in this. This is the Blood Magic Wizard. 
Again, I'm going to say that if you're squeamish around blood stuff or you're not really into that kind of thing, uh, maybe you want to avoid that next video. Um, but that is the next one I'm going to be going over, right? I am Saberwolf. Thank you and have a good day.